Hi, I'm Marissa. Hi, my name is Sarah. Hi, I'm Chase. Hi, I'm Andrea. Hi, I'm Veronica. Hi, I'm Tanya. Hi, my name's Kelsey. And I'm an The butterfly biosphere is home to over 160,000 individual bugs. Our conservatory showcases about 60 different species of butterfly, and our entomology lab and exhibit spaces are filled with about 50 different types of arachnids and 50 species of insects, including walking sticks, praying mantises, beetles, roaches, katydids, bumblebees, even a leafcutter ant colony, not to mention a handful of millipedes, centipedes, isopods, snails, and hermit crabs. When our guests visit, we hope that through play and curiosity, they can explore the many important roles that bugs fill in their ecosystems. And we hope that they can find beauty and wonder in the many shapes, colors, and behaviors of this incredibly diverse group of animals. To maintain such a large collection of live invertebrates for our guests to engage with, we have a team of five invertebrate keepers who work diligently and passionately to ensure all our animals have the highest levels of health, safety, and well-being that we can provide. Join us to experience a typical day in the life of an entomologist. Our exhibits run today which means that I'm responsible for checking and taking care of all of our non-butterfly exhibits before we open the venue at 10 o'clock. There are about 35 exhibits in our exhibit gallery. For each one I'm checking the animal's health, making sure that they're present, alive, and noting any injuries or behaviors that I should be aware of. I'm giving them fresh food, checking that they have a full clean water dish, or if they drink water droplets I spray some water droplets off the side of their enclosure to drink. I also have to check the enclosure's overall humidity. For animals that are tropical and require high humidity, I make sure their substrate is uniformly moist and that they get sprayed with water every day. For animals that need less humidity, I ensure that only part of their substrate is moist so they have a gradient in their enclosure and can choose to sit on either the drier side or the wetter side. I also look at the overall show quality, which might include things like wiping the sides of the enclosures, changing a dying plant, or making sure that the animal is relatively visible for guests. Our guests can actually watch me take care of these animals since I'm in an entirely separate room from them. We wait until after we open the venue to care for these exhibits to provide that opportunity for them to see the animal care. In the lab, we each take care of a specific group of invertebrates, like carnivores or herbivores, but on exhibits where we are showcasing the biodiversity of the invertebrate world for our guests, I have to stay aware of a wide variety of care types, so I use a to-do list to help me ensure that everyone is getting the right care they need on the right schedule. In the conservatory, we're lucky to have an amazing horticulture team that cares for the plants and flowers the butterflies drink nectar from. The entomology team comes in each morning to refill the nectar feeders with Gatorade and twice a week to replace the fruits. It sounds gross, but the more rotten and juicy, the more the butterflies like them. We also collect all the butterflies that have died the previous day. They only have a two to three week lifespan, so it's normal to collect a pile like this daily. Any specimens that are in good condition, we preserve and catalog, so they're available for guests to purchase for insect pinning or art projects. In the lab, the most important part of the butterfly run is to collect all of the freshly emerged butterflies so they can be released into the conservatory for their first flight. When they first emerge from their chrysalis, their wings are wet and crumpled, so we have to give them time to expand and dry their wings, usually a couple of hours. I can tell that they're ready to fly once they've started fluttering to the bottom or the front wall of their emergence chamber. I won't bother the ones still hanging from their chrysalis, so I don't risk damaging their wings before they're fully hardened. We collect and release them twice a day, so they'll have their chance to fly this afternoon. After I've done that, I also have to remove any butterflies that died in their chrysalis or weren't able to fully expand their wings. They won't be able to fly in the conservatory to find food. It's sad, but that's nature. Not all of our offspring are able to make it to adulthood. The normal success rate for healthy butterflies reaching adulthood is 85% or so. So while we collect butterflies from the chambers, we record how many emerged, how many failed to emerge, and how many had deformed wings. This is how we understand if we're meeting that success rate or if we need to make improvements in our care. 
All of our butterflies are hatched and raised on small farms in their native countries where there are plenty of tropical host plants for those hungry caterpillars to eat. Once they enter the chrysalis phase, they're shipped around the world to butterfly houses like us. We receive two to three shipments of butterfly pupae every week, about 1,200 total. We glue them to strings so they can complete metamorphosis and emerge as butterflies, and that takes about seven to 10 days for most of our species. Today I'm caring for the carnivores in the lab. Most carnivores are fed on a once a week schedule, so each day we have one or two carnivores scheduled to be fed. Today it's the scorpions and the assassin bugs. The tailless whip scorpions are a little skittish and prefer to hunt at night when it's quiet. They use their long sensitive whips to feel for prey in the dark. So I'm just going to drop a cricket in the enclosure and mark on its label for us to check tomorrow to see if it was eaten. The scorpions feel for their food in the wild with sensitive hairs on their claws. So I'm going to use the tongs to bring a live cricket close enough for the scorpion to feel and then hunt it. We keep records of what each carnivore eats and how often they refuse their food. This helps us understand if they have prey preferences and what their typical eating habits are. So if something abnormal is observed, they like they refuse food for a few weeks in a row, we can assess that animal more closely. Often carnivores will refuse food when they are preparing to shed their exoskeleton. The assassin bugs are carnivores that live in a group, so we're going to scatter feed live prey items since we can't track each individual's eating habits. We monitor the general body condition of the group, their growth rates, and their death rates to ensure that we're scattering enough prey items for everyone to be fed. I'm Chase and I'm servicing our decomposers today. These bugs are some of the most feared, misunderstood, and disgust inducing because of their job as decomposers and the locations they live to do that and make that happen. They play a critical role in eating and breaking down those materials in soil and other places that uh, make our world fairly gross. So they remove the litter from the environment so that it doesn't build up. They reduce the spread of disease by quickly breaking down rotting carrion, and they turn and aerate the soil with their movements and activities. When they poop, the decomposing materials are now smaller and more accessible for other organisms to break down like fungus and bacteria. And those organisms release the nutrients back into the ecosystems for plants to uptake and grow. So for decomposer care, we pay close attention to what's in their substrate. We include decomposing wood, leaf litter, and compost soil. That's what I'm mixing together here. Since that is the bulk of their diet, and even in those three materials, different species have different ratios of those materials that they need. So it's also important to keep the substrate at specific levels of humidity. Um, in fact, that's why you'll find a lot of uh, invertebrates out in the wild, decomposers out in the wild will be under rotting logs and deeper in the soil, because that's where that hydration and that humidity is that they need. The isopods, for example, are crustaceans and they breathe through their gills. So we have to pay attention to the moisture levels, which is why I'm giving them a good spray. So for all the bugs in this area, yes, they eat the substrate that we mix up for them. And this produce is a nice bonus. It adds variety into their diet. And I'm offering dog food because it gives them protein that they would get from other sources out in the wild from things such as carrion. Jasmines are well known for their camouflage, uh, so you can see we like to showcase stick insects with a variety of colors, shapes, and sizes. We've got leaves, sticks, um, sticks with thorny accents, uh, and then we have these silly little kids that are not camouflaged at all. They can actually spray a defensive liquid to deter predators, so they have warning colors of black with red and gold details. The sticks are all herbivores, meaning they only eat fresh plants, which we call browse. We get shipments of blackberry to feed them throughout the year, and we use other plants from the conservatory and around the property like oak, rose, porterweed, pothos, and honeysuckle to provide a healthy, varied diet. So we've been going through our daily duties and routine, but we also have to plan time into our monthly and quarterly duties like substrate changes, filter cleaning, and censusing. We count most of our group populations on a monthly basis, some on a quarterly basis. Censusing uh, helps us stay accountable for the individuals in our care, but most importantly, it's how we track population changes. If we know what trends are normal for our collection, 
Any abnormal numbers can alert us to an issue we may not have noticed that is affecting their health, like a drop in the enclosure humidity. My favorite thing about the job is learning more about bugs every day and helping people overcome their fear of bugs. I love learning more about the different species and their specific behaviors in the lab because it just shows how diverse invertebrates are and that to me is pretty amazing. I get to work with creatures that not many people in the world have ever had a chance to get close to and not many will. It's quite something else to be able to take care of things that are so exotic and to be able to provide them with the things that they need as well as being able to share them with the public and give them experiences that they won't be able to find anywhere else. I have access to all sorts of different invertebrates that I would never otherwise be able to interact with. I get to witness specific behaviors in a variety of different species that aren't available to the general public. I love designing new habitats for our bugs. I like when I make a new enclosure and you put the bug in it for the first time, watching it explore the new space, to smell the new materials, to climb new areas, get under things, figure out where it's gonna rest from now on. It's enriching for the bug and it's rewarding for me. And then bonus points, if once it settles, our guests can still see it. I am doing my dream job. There's no such thing as one thing. This is my dream job.